when it comes to the capitalism, they're talking about that capitalism is by far the most effective and productive economic system. Ohio Senator James Wentz just recently said that Russia produces as much ammunition in a day as the U.S. does in a month. What's the problem with the U.S. economy that they're not capable of producing enough ammunition to help Ukraine? Well, let me begin with a comment. Uh, I do not believe it is an exaggeration to say that the spokespersons for every economic system in the history of the world have included people who say that whatever system they are the spokesperson of is the best and the most efficient and the most equitable and the most and the most fill in the blank with positive adjectives. This is childish. And you, you would imagine that a reasonably mature people would get beyond this kind of cheerleading uh, if they're involved in a serious uh, conversation. It is actually very easy to show whether you are looking at ancient tribal economy or village economies or slave economies or feudal economies, that they had their areas where they were remarkably efficient, side by side with areas where they were remarkably inefficient, assuming that there's a standard that enables you to distinguish between them, which frankly, I don't believe there ever was or is. Let me explain briefly. When you notice that there's profitability in a particular industry, and the CEO or the CEOs in that industry are asked, why are you profitable? And they give that wonderful answer that they should have outgrown in fourth grade. Uh, we're a very efficient company here. The only appropriate response is laughter. Why? Well, what does efficiency mean? Conventionally in economics, Efficiency purports to do the following thing. It looks at the consequences of some act. Let's take a, for example, uh, is it efficient to expand the hospital to add a new wing to that hospital? Or for a company, is it efficient to buy a fleet of trucks or to hire 50,000 more people or whatever? Whatever the issue is, Here's what you're taught. You look at all the benefits that flow from this act, and you look at all the costs of this act, and you compare them. If the benefits are larger than the costs, why then it's efficient, and you go ahead and do it. And if the costs are better than or larger than the the total of benefits, well, then it's inefficient and you don't do it, okay? All right, now here are two simple problems. And here I'm simply talking basic philosophy or if you like, basic mathematics. How do you know all of the costs or all of the benefits of anything that has ever happened or that could ever happen? And the answer is, you cannot do that, and no one ever has. Part of the reason is that costs and benefits lie in the future. And it's kind of hard to get a good number on what they will be. And if there is an economist who knows what the costs will be, well, then that economist is going to become very rich because they have figured out how to tell the future which of course is a scam. They can't do that. Number two, the costs and benefits are infinite in number and variety. To go back to my example, suppose there's a hospital considering building a new wing. Well, if they build that new wing, it will change traffic patterns in that area. Change traffic patterns will alter real estate prices. 
change traffic patterns will change the number of people that get injured or die in automobile accidents. How in the world can you know in advance what all the costs from doing this are? And the answer is you cannot. So here's what all cost benefit analyses have in common. They are frauds because they cannot do what they claim to do. What they actually do is look at a selection of the costs that you can do and a selection of the benefits that you can do. But then the only interesting thing is the principle of selection because it isn't a comprehensive comparison. Long story short, if you do any serious investigation, then you cannot evaluate the efficiency of any economic system. And the people who claim that it is the most efficient are giving you, to use a technical term, total bullshit, and they ought to be called on the carpet for doing that. There is, it, it really is kind of childish. CBS did the report, 60 Minutes, back in May of last year. And in that report, they showed that the Defense Department of the United States is a place that doesn't have enough ammunition because the companies producing defense equipment, you know, planes, ships, missiles, guns, are engaged in, and you can see the statements there from all the relevant officials, price gouging. And the price gouging is not modest. The price gouging is outrageous. And they give you the figures there, a price that's a hundred times what it ought to be or more. Here's the irony. It's not that Russia can produce what we can't produce. My guess is the United States can outproduce Russia. Let's remember the GDP with all the problems which we have discussed about what the GDP means. But the GDP of the United States is $21, $22 trillion, and the GDP of Russia is $1.5 trillion. We are talking vastly different industrial systems. And the reason why the United States doesn't have enough ammunition, and by the way, that is part of the reality of why Russia is doing as well in the war in Ukraine as it is. It's not because they produce more or better. It's because they don't have, and this is going to affect a lot of Americans if they take this seriously, they don't have the level of corruption that we do. We have outdone them. And you know what this is like? This is the same story that has afflicted every empire in human history. This is the story of why the Romans could not defeat the barbarians in the fifth century AD. It's why medieval kingdoms fell apart. It's not because they couldn't produce enough knives and guns and spears and all the rest of it, but that the internal mechanisms of the system made it no longer functional. And bullshit like efficiency calculus is part of the mental corruption, if you like, these make-believe categories. We look back on the Middle Ages and we smile to one another when decisions were made by kings and queens who consulted their advisors, who read the appropriate passage in the Bible to find the answer. We think we're better than that. The Bible, we say, was a book. There were lots of books. Why pick that one? Yeah, well, 
the notion that you can do the right thing by following Jesus is exactly on a par with the notion that you can do the right thing by choosing the efficient alternative as if you were in a position to do that. I used to tell my students, all the training in the world will not enable you to leap over the Empire State Building. You just can't jump over it. So you don't bother training to do what you know you can't do. Why do we train people in cost-benefit analysis? It is a mirage. It is an ideological exercise in order to sanction whatever decisions are made for altogether different reasons by pretending they have been authorized by an objective outside absolutely true arbitrator. Well, in medieval times, that was called God. Today, we call it efficiency analysis. It is the same fantasy. Well, I think that uh, you don't have to look at the future in order to make projections. I think efficiency is in the eye of the beholder. Uh, yes. Boeing, for instance, is much in the news. And Boeing yeah. found it uh, uh, very efficient. Uh, instead of making airplanes uh, uh, that were adjusted to new fuel-efficient engines, it found it more efficient to make airplanes and crash. Uh, to the uh, executives, that was efficient because they could use their money instead of changing uh, the engineering around, instead of building a new airplane, they could use the revenue that they were getting simply to uh, for stock buybacks and to pay out of dividends. Uh, so that was very efficient. Uh, you know, and uh, in terms of prices, of course you can forecast prices if uh, you're in a monopoly position and you can charge whatever you want. You decide uh, what price you're going to charge. Uh, it's uh, at your will, and uh, you can you have control over costs, especially it's the government. That's what uh, the Pentagon capitalism is. That I think was uh, really was what the uh, uh, interview was talking about. Under ca Pentagon capitalism, uh, I think uh, uh, a decade ago it was making a toilet seat for uh, twenty dollars and charging uh, thirty five hundred dollars for it. But uh, now they're even more uh, egregious uh, overruns. Uh, it's very efficient if you're a Boeing uh, or a another uh, military contractor. It's not efficient from the whole economy. So I think the really uh, the real question, uh, since uh, uh, the, our talk is about capitalism versus socialism, is uh, what's efficiency uh, under capitalism, and uh, what's productive and productivity? Well, the textbook uh, presentation of industrial capitalism says it's very efficient, uh, uh, and it was efficient in the nineteenth century. It was more efficient than feudalism. And that was really what industrial capitalism uh, set out uh, to be, to cut cost, not to raise the costs of uh, Pentagon capitalism and what you're talking about, but to cut costs. And it, uh, it cut the economy's overall costs by getting rid of the landlord class. Uh, so instead of uh, paying uh, land rent to uh, hereditary aristocracy, you would use that as a tax base. Uh, you would uh, essentially uh, get rid of monopoly rent and you'd get rid of financial rent. In other words, what made capitalism efficient was that it was moving towards socialism. And it was moving towards socialism by having the government take the lead in providing uh, basic needs uh, uh, for, the, uh, what it, for the cost of living and for uh, the cost of doing business so that the employers didn't have to pay them. Uh, the, uh, these costs were to be paid essentially by progressive taxation of the wealthiest property owners, and the wealthiest uh, uh, financial uh, operators. Uh, and as I think as we discussed uh, last time, the income tax in America in 1913 fell only on the uh, wealthiest uh, 1%. So uh, in the 19th century, industrial capitalism uh, certainly looked productive to the extent that uh, it was uh, supporting a mixed economy, a private, 
public economy that was moving towards uh, the government uh, 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 producing all of the communications, education, health services, transportation that could otherwise be monopolized or that uh, labor would have to pay for and hence the employers would have to pay for. So the question is, uh, you know, what went wrong? Uh, well, what went wrong was that the the rent recipient class fall back and uh, the uh, they fought back for the last century, uh, ever since World War II and especially since the 1980s, we don't have industrial capitalism anymore. Uh, sometimes it's called monopoly capitalism, but I prefer to call it finance capitalism because uh, banks are the mother of monopolies and it's the financial sector that has promoted monopolies because they can efficiently make money much, more, uh, much uh, easier simply by uh, charging uh, uh, whatever they want and uh, not having to take the customers into account, not by producing uh, good materials. Efficiency today is a race to the bottom. It's a race to the bottom in employment. It's a race to the bottom in quality. It's a race to the bottom uh, for Boeing making airplanes that sudden that uh, uh, don't really have uh, much uh, uh, oversight and uh, regulatory control, and they uh, uh, their uh, doors blow open and and they crash. So again, uh, we're living in a world where the whole concept of efficiency uh, changes, and productivity uh, is no longer simply the physical productivity of uh, output per man hour. Uh, it's uh, how do you create wealth? And you create wealth and be productive uh, in the way that uh, Goldman Sachs had said uh, that Goldman Sachs uh, partners were the most productive workers in the United States because they make the most money and they make the most money financially. They make the most money by taking over companies, uh, uh, breaking them up, smashing them down, and uh, essentially uh, deindustrializing them. So uh, today, the most efficient capitalism is post-industrial capitalism or finance capitalism. Uh, uh, you say it's corrupt, and they say, "No, we've just uh, we've uh, uh, made politics a free market." And if uh, Boeing and uh, other um, the military spending people have the ability to back the campaigns of the congressmen on the uh, uh, mili on the uh, military committees and the uh, the monopoly committees, and uh, if they don't back uh, what uh, we're doing, if they criticize us, we'll just uh, use the free market to back their uh, political opponents in the next uh, primary. Uh, election. So again, what is efficiency? Uh, it's no longer what it used to be. There's a point that um, Michael made that uh, is recognized, at least in the textbooks in economics. It's one of those topics that you blow through in 10 minutes of some lecture and never uh, return to it because it is embarrassing if you return to it, since it invalidates most of the rest of the semester's work. It's a distinction between private profitability and social profitability, or private costs and social costs. And, and the argument is really very simple. Uh, let's take a situation where a capitalist decides uh, it is quote unquote more efficient I am going to buy this new machine and that will allow me uh, to fire 50 workers because the new machine can do what those 50 workers used to do. So our capitalist compares the machine only costs 100 and the money he saves by firing 50 workers is 200. So he's ahead if he buys the machine and fires the workers. So he does. There's a net gain to him of 100, the difference between the money he had to lay out for the machine and the money he saved from firing the worker. Very simple, very logical. Now the question, are we done? Have we now seen an efficient act? Has our capitalist pursuing the profitable outcome, made the right decision. Well, to do that, we'd have to look at the costs and the benefits. And let me tell you about the costs. 
they are not just the buying of the machine by Mr. Capitalist. The costs are everything that happens to those 50 workers, their spouses, their children, the neighborhood they live in, the real estate values of the homes they occupy, the viability of the stores they used to patronize. I could go on. We know from a thousand studies that those 50 unemployed people will have higher rates of alcoholism, spouse abuse, mental, physical injury and illness. Those are costs. Society is going to have to bear those costs. The doctors, the social workers, you know, the difficulties, the uh, fired workers' children are now going to have in school because there's turmoil at home, because mother or father are out of work. Nobody counts it. It, it, it. Because capitalism refuses to take any responsibility for those 50 workers, we in the world of analysis, thinkers, professors, whatever we are, we are supposed to somehow blindly go along with complete bullshit that we are finished when we compare the cost of the machine that automates with the uh, the loss of those jobs. And the minute you don't do that, the minute you admit that the social costs are not exhausted by those private costs that are counted by the capitalist. Remember, he only counts what he has to pay for. The only thing he has to do is pay for the new machine. He doesn't have to pay for the mental health counseling of the children of the fired workers. Not his responsibility. So for him, that cost does not exist. But for those of us that are interested in the community as a whole, the costs do exist. And a system that constantly pretends otherwise is going to be making one decision after another that is inefficient, because if you look at all the costs, they far exceed the benefits. And here's what's worse. The benefits flow to one part of the community, and the costs are borne by another part of the community, making it a political explosion of what's going on here. Automation is profitable to the employer class, and it is an enormous burden and cost to the employee class. And because of that, it comes back and bites the employer in the rear end as well. It is a social economic disaster. And if you were honest in economics, you'd know that, and you wouldn't teach the rest of the course on the premise that profit as an incentive is some successful mechanism. It isn't. It's idiotic. Well, well uh, when you talk about social costs, you're really talking about uh, the long-run costs in the sense of what are the results of this uh, automation you're talking about? Uh, but finance uh, lives in the sh short run. And if uh, you have uh, corporations controlled by the financial sector, they live in the short run and they don't care about financial costs. And even more, they try to make the government pay the cleanup costs. Uh, you can take, for instance, uh, uh, oil fra uh, fracking. Uh, it pays uh, for the oil frackers to uh, uh, pump uh, chemicals into the ground to force uh, the gas uh, or oil up to the surface, and the result is to pollute the water supply. So you can light a match to the water that comes out of your tap and uh, it catches on fire. Uh, for the uh, oil companies and for the uh, financial, for the banks and the financial investors, uh, this is a very, uh, this is a high productivity. Uh, you can take, uh, and if you have uh, the uh, financial sector writing the laws that shape the marketplace, you have something like the Trans-Pacific Partnership that said, suppose you have an oil company that uh, pollutes the land, for instance, of uh, Ecuador 
or in uh, Kazakhstan, uh, if a government passes a law saying uh, now the oil company has to pay the cleanup costs of cleaning up the pollution that it's caused uh, in the uh, waterways or in the land, uh, they have to uh, reimburse the company for the entire fine because uh, that's an external economy. Well, what you're talking about, Richard, is the, the external economy is society. Uh, right. So that if a government imposes a cost to benefit society at the cost of uh, the American foreign investor or any other foreign investor, that's against the law legally, and no government can end up uh, receiving any money for the cleanup costs that it doesn't have to immediately pay right back into the company. Uh, so in effect, the role of government is to protect the polluters uh, and uh, to protect uh, what you call profits and I call economic rent. Because increasingly, uh, the profits of uh, uh, oil companies and uh, mining companies and uh, monopolies uh, are unearned income. They're not, uh, they're not producing value. They're producing uh, a right to charge whatever you want to charge uh, so that you don't have to project uh, the value of uh, something in terms of the costs, the labor costs and the raw material costs. Again, uh, you're, you're uh, getting a free lunch uh, without working, without producing value, uh, just by collecting rent. And uh, of course, the, na the uh, GDP accounts, the national income accounts, calls all of this earnings. Uh, but they're not really earned income. They're not profits. Again, uh, they're economic rent. And that's the kind of rent-seeking economy that we've uh, uh, come into. It's a tunnel-visioned economy. You call it corrupt. The uh, economics are uh, corrupt. Uh, they're really tunnel-visioned. They don't want to take in the social costs because that would reduce the returns to uh, the financial uh, owners of uh, the, the companies that are imposing these costs on society at large. If I could add, I agree completely, but I, I, I want to take it kind of another um, another step, if I could. There is a bizarre phenomena going on here that we should understand. When Michael says that the government is called in to clean up, the government is called in to protect, the government is called in to serve, whether it's the, cap the employer class as a whole, or a subdivision of it that gets into a dominant position, like finance capital in recent decades. Here's the remarkable thing about that. Not only is government called in to bail out the failed capitalist system. Let's all remember, in 2008 and 9, all of the major banks in the United States, the big ones, were bankrupt. By the definition of liabilities relative to assets, they were busted. They could not, they, they didn't trust each other to give each other overnight loans the way they normally do every day because they weren't confident that Bank of America or Citibank or Wells Fargo would give back in the morning what was lent to them the night before because they might do a Lehman Brothers or a Bear Stearns or any of the others that folded, okay? Okay, here's the wonderful part about that. At the same time that the government is the servant, the faithful, desperate servant of the employer class, it develops an ideology which says that capitalism is a perfect system except when the government messes up. We call these people, because they like the label, libertarians, but it has nothing to do with liberty. It's an ironic Aldous Huxley kind of inversion of the word meaning. This has nothing to do with liberty. This is a hustle. This is a person selling you a major interest in the Brooklyn Bridge. Blame the government. Brilliant. Every flaw that capitalism has, you can now admit and use it to beat up on the government with the effect that all the government is left with the responsibility of doing is bailing out capitalism's failures because otherwise it has been beaten to death with demonization 
as if it were the problem. Most of the people who will become powerful in the United States if Donald Trump wins the election will be libertarian infused policymakers who are going to act on this lunacy with, by the way, the predictable results, which are not pretty. I'm glad you mentioned uh, li the concept of liberty and libertarians. Uh, you're absolutely right. Libertarianism uh, supports a centrally planned economy, much more centrally planned than a mixed economy, more centrally planned than an economy like China. But uh, the central planning is done not by elected government officials, but by Wall Street and the financial right. sectors. So uh, when people say they're a libertarian, they say they want liberty from government regulation. So they don't have to follow uh, rules to protect society. They want liberty from being taxed. Uh, so that it's uh, labor and uh, the productive sectors that are taxed, not uh, the uh, uh, corporate sector and the financial sector that owns the, uh, uh, the sector. So the question is, liberty from whom? Uh, and uh, this is what, again, the language has been inverted from what it was during the heyday of industrial capitalism from Adam Smith and uh, John Stuart Mill and Marx uh, into uh, just the opposite. Uh, so uh, every uh, the, the way to uh, to uh, respond to these guys is again the meaning of words, and uh, that's what made George Orwell's discussion of double think and double speak so great. Enormously important this topic because these these are not just uh, pathological behaviors; these are not just the objects of what Michael and I can say critically. These are symptoms of a system that is done, that is over its peak, that is in decline. Holding on to these nonsensical ideas becomes rational because the system is spinning out of control. Here you have, a, a again, I'm going to use Ukraine, even if it provokes some people. On one side, the United States, the G7, Britain, France, Germany, Italy, Canada, Japan, and the United States. A combined GDP, and again, I, without lauding that statistic, it's just a very rough measure. But a combined GDP, by my count, about $32 trillion. In a war in Ukraine with a country, Russia, with a GDP of one and a half trillion dollars. This is a joke. What kind of war is this? This is David and Goliath, only they're David and we're Goliath. It's ridiculous. And the fact that it isn't, that the Russians have actually won the war, at least so far, tells you that something is terribly amiss. <laughs> Mr. Zelensky is explaining that they don't have enough ammunition. They've used up the shells, the tanks, the missiles, not just from the United States, but from Britain, France, Germany, and so on. What in the world is going on? How does a one and a half trillion dollar economy find itself inadequately producing what $32 trillion worth of economy is like something is crazy here. And I think that is where people ought to take this kind of thinking. If a university is teaching people that there's an efficiency and you can learn how to count costs and benefits, this is the this is the exact modern equivalent of having taught medieval scholars how to count the number of angels that dance on the head of a pin. Angels have no dimensions. The head of the pin is very small, but it, how many angels can very small accommodate? An infinity if they have no dimensions. Those are, and there were debates about this, and we think it's funny. But I can assure you, in the future, there'll be people who look back 
on this nonsense about efficiency and the nonsense about libertarianism, shaking their heads in disbelief that reasonably educated adults got caught up in this sort of stuff.